Hey everyone, welcome back. Thanks for fitting me in your schedule. Laszlo Montgomery here with another China History Podcast. Number 259, if you will. I must admit, lately, the CHP listener requests for overseas Chinese-related topics have been more frequent than usual. So I decided to use the powers vested in me as one of the biggest shareholders here and preempt this week's regularly scheduled topic and by demand pulled this one out of storage instead. In past CHP episodes, we've looked at some of the history of overseas Chinese communities, Diochus, Hokkien, Toisan, as well as a few of the immigrant experiences of the Chinese diaspora in the U.S. and Mexico. But we've never looked at the history of overseas Chinese country by country. Ethnic Chinese are spread out all over the world, and like all the other great and prosperous diasporas of the world, with the overseas Chinese, their history and circumstances varied from country to country. On China's home continent of Asia, there are a handful of places where the stories and the sweep of the history are more epic in scale than in other places, where Chinese migration had such a profound impact on the economic, political, and cultural development of those countries. I'm talking about the Southeast Asian nations, members of ASEAN. And of these countries, I thought I might start with Thailand and the Thai Chinese. If you compare their stories to the Chinese who migrated to the Philippines, Singapore, Malaysia, Indonesia, Myanmar, Cambodia, and Vietnam, there are some common threads that run unbroken through all their histories, but each one has its own unique story. You know, the bare minimum of China history was offered in my high school classes. The most I had on offer was like uh, one semester of general world history, with China covered in maybe one or two weeks of classes. That was it. And no AP world history where I went either. Just AP. U.S. and European scored Cinco on both. Today, of course, it's much different, and there's more... Chinese history offered in American high schools now than in my day. Language, too. But as far as Southeast Asian history, forget it. The only reason Vietnam even gets mentioned in American high schools is because of the war. I'm sure there are places where this history is taught, but uh, it probably costs 60 grand a year for tuition. So here in the beautiful country, when it comes to the histories of all the countries, basically from Myanmar East to the Philippines, not a well-represented history in American K-12 through education, and certainly not when I was growing up, which was during the Vietnam War. So although I was never taught any of that history, at least I regularly heard or read the names of every single one of these countries. To all people who live there or are experts in this region, I beg your indulgence in how I present this topic. Not everyone has had the good fortune to live there or has had that magnificent pleasure of living in those beautiful nations and learning about them up close. Veteran podcaster Charles Kimball has been doing the Southeast Asia History Podcast since 2016, almost 100 episodes. Plenty of Thai history on offer there. That's a good place to start if you're interested. I'll have a link in the show notes. A lot of the fine print involving some of the names I'm mentioning, are all covered in a number of Mr. Kimball's episodes. We'll look at the history of the Chinese and many other countries between now and the time I decide to call it quits and live off the fat of my CHP royalties. But in this episode, I thought, eh, what the heck, let's start with one country who could make the claim to have more ethnic Chinese living within their borders than any other country except China. It's not an easy story to tell because without a past study of Thai history that could serve as a kind of baseline, that's hard to take it all in. But let's just wing it and I'm sure we'll make out just fine. Thai history, like all histories except ours of course, it goes way back. It's all tangled up with the histories of Burma, the Khmers, Vietnamese, and Laotians. And also, just as important, were of people we don't hear too much about now. These were the Mon people. The Mon, M-O-N, were the most ancient people of Burma and Thailand. 
Today, the Mon people are mostly found in parts of southeast Myanmar. They were one of the original Austroasiatic peoples to populate this area, along with the Khmers. The Mon established a kingdom called Hari Punjai, mostly northern Thailand. It lasted until the time of the Mongols. The Hari Punjai kingdom was replaced in the late 13th century by the kingdom of Lanna, who everyone in Chiang Mai probably heard of. That was where the Lanna rulers based their kingdom. Good choice. Actually, it was established at Lampun, just a little bit south of Chiang Mai. The next major group of people to migrate in the direction of Siam were from one of the major ethnic groups of southwest China. These were the Thai people, T-A-I. It's believed the most ancestral homeland of these Thai people was around Guangxi province about a thousand years ago, 11th century. They began to migrate into parts of Southeast Asia, Laos, Vietnam, Myanmar, and Thailand. The Dai, ethnic minority, D-A-I, is one of the more well-known folk of southwest China, Yunnan province. They are among this group who speak this Thai language. Again, T-A-I. In Mandarin, this is the character Thai, like in Taiwan. There's northern, central, and southwest branches of this Thai language family. I hope you don't mind if I keep switching off between Myanmar and Burma. Whenever we're talking about the past history, let's use Burma and reserve Myanmar for everything else. Same thing with Siam and Thailand. No insult or disrespect intended. So these Thai people, originally from the mountains of Guangxi, when they got as far as modern-day Thailand, they settled there and mixed with the local Mon, married, assimilated. And what came about in central and southern Thailand were these new people who spoke a language from this Kra Dai linguistic branch. No one's 100% sure where the word for the Thai people came from. Perhaps from the word Sukhothai, the name of the first kingdom in those parts. As for the word Siam, well, it's thought this came from the Sanskrit word Siam. When the Portuguese, who we'll get to in a minute, when they came in the 16th century, well, they started using this term, Siam, as a moniker for this land. We'll get to this later, but Prime Minister Plek Fibun Songkram, a.k.a. Fibun, June 24th, 1938, he said, from now on, our nation's to be called Thailand. That's when the switchover happened. Then in 1944 came the novel Anna and the King of Siam, followed by the 1946 hit movie with Yul Brenner and the 1951 stage musical of the same name. And Americans were confused for decades to follow. Siam or Thailand? There's a whole lot to say about the Thai, T-A-I, people and their migration throughout Southeast Asia, seeding these new communities around those parts. And for the purposes of our story today, they played a rather significant role in the early history of today's great modern Thai kingdom. I'm skirting the history of Thailand. The gravity is drawing me in, but let's just give the main idea of the political situation happening there as it related to the earliest Chinese. The last and final immigrant group who, you know, like other ancient peoples before them, migrated to this beautiful land. I guess a good place to begin our story would be in the Ayutthaya Kingdom, 1351 to 1767. They were the ones who welcomed Admiral Zheng He during his seven voyages between 1405 to 1433. Three times his vessel sailed up the Chao Praia. The Ayutthaya Kingdom was concurrent with the last decade of the Yuan, the entire Ming, and roughly the first 120 years of the Qing. So Ayutthaya figures quite prominently in our story. There are four principal kingdoms that we'll mention. The Sukhothai kingdom, 1238 to 1438, and then running concurrent to the Sukhothai for 87 years, was the Ayutthaya kingdom, as I said, 1351 to 1767. They would later absorb the Sukhothai kingdom into their state. And they were followed by the 15-year Tanburi kingdom, 1767 to 1782, essentially the reign of one king, who we'll look at later in part two, Taksin the Great, 
And finally, the Chakri dynasty, or Bangkok kingdom, of the present day. They've been the royal house since 1782, one year before the USA officially became a country following the Treaty of Paris. Well, we know of the diasporas that followed certain historical events in China and elsewhere, but as far as the Big Bang, when the most brave and adventurous of all dared to set sail for these parts unknown, came during the 1200s and 1300s, the time of the Mongol conquests and the subsequent Pax Mongolica. Back then, the Sukhothai king had sent a number of tribute missions to China. If you had a pugnacious antagonizer in the region, it was to the Chinese emperor that lesser princes and kings went for support. And for the longest time, four political entities fought with each other incessantly. For the Sukhothai, they fought constantly with the neighboring Mon and Khmer, who also lived amidst this rich Chao Praya Basin. During the 13th century, a first noticeable wave of Chinese took to the seas or came overland, and these, well, mostly unsung pioneers were the very first ones to seed the cities that would grow around all the ports throughout Nanyang, as this region was referred to, the South Ocean. This was the Chinese word for this whole Southeast Asian region. And when the next big Chinese wave of migration happened, these people were already present, in this case, during the Sukhothai Kingdom. These earliest Chinese didn't go there for a vacation. They were pioneers who went for trade. Even though these times I just mentioned were before the age of exploration in the West, at least in these parts of the world, it wasn't unheard of to board a ship and sail great distances. The Song Dynasty was a very big age for shipbuilding, and China's first permanent navy was established in 1132, out of necessity, to fight the invading Jurchen Jin forces. So by this time, Chinese already knew how to build seafaring vessels, and the idea of going on such an adventure wasn't such a big deal to some. And these earliest Chinese voyagers, who didn't leave any records beyond whatever shipwrecks were found went far and wide, sailing even beyond the Andaman Sea. Back then, the Straits of Malacca was so pirate-infested, traders would sail into the Gulf of Thailand, come ashore with their boats on the east coast, and portage across the skinniest part of the peninsula, and load up their vessel on the west coast. Well, the next big milestone would be 1368. The Yuan Dynasty fell, and the Ming began their 276-year run. Ayutthaya is a city located just north of Bangkok, about an hour drive. At this moment in Thai history, Bangkok is still a a minor place of no significance. In 1370, fortune smiled on the Ayutthaya king when he was invited to pay tribute to the new Chinese Ming emperor, who in this case was the founder of the dynasty, the Hongwu emperor, a.k.a. Zhu Yuanzhang. Why was this such a good thing for the king of Ayutthaya? Well, people back then knew what we know in our day, that China was a great and powerful nation, and lesser nations were more than willing to pay tribute to China, where there was so much trade potential and the political legitimacy that, you know, went with the deal. So the earliest Thai-Chinese relations, I guess you could trace back to this time, when the Hongwu emperor instituted the first of several high Jin orders, or the banning of all private foreign trade. The Kangxi Emperor will do the same thing. But like it is with true love, a well, trade always finds a way. Though the penalties were severe if you got caught defying this royal ban, private trade still continued. As long as you didn't get caught, it was a very profitable enterprise. The Ming Emperor had sent an envoy to Ayutthaya in 1370, where the king there was formally recognized as the legitimate government. The Sukhothai Kingdom it was still around, but again, they were already under the thumb of the Ayutthaya king. Government-sponsored and regulated two-way trade became the main conduit for commerce, and this came in the form of structured tribute trade, which was still very worthwhile for the loyal kingdoms and principalities who came to bow before the emperor and present gifts. They never walked away empty-handed. 
And then came the Yongle Emperor, 1403 to 1423. He's famous for many things, and one of them for sure was his personal backing of the voyages of Admiral Zheng He and the golden age of tribute trade that these epic voyages ushered in. There's nothing in the official record that mentions Zheng He's personal visit, but it was suggested that Ma Huan, also a major figure in this great Chinese fleet, did visit Ayutthaya. That would have been on the 1413 expedition, the fourth. And into the 15th century, all these men who sailed with this fleet and on these enormous treasure ships, they went back to China with tales of miracles and wonders of this incredible land, Nanyang, Southeast Asia, and all the riches to be had there from well, commodities that were strongly in demand in China and freely available there. And the siren song that in our time attracts so many people from all over the world, well, so it was in Ming Dynasty China. And if you had innate entrepreneurial smarts and feared not the challenges of getting to these new destinations, or perhaps already had a friend or fellow villager already set up there, there was no better place in all the world. So in the wake of Zheng He's voyages and everything they opened up, there came more and more Chinese migrants. 1412 was a banner year. A Chinese based in Ayutthaya became the first Siamese ambassador to China. It became very involved in all the tribute trade missions, and this continued to fan the flames of growing Chinese Siam trade. The Haijin, or Sea Ban, was still in effect, but everyone knew this wasn't going to last forever. Remember, it banned private trade and prohibited Chinese from leaving China for other lands. So the Chinese, who were already present in Thailand prior to the Ming, were perfectly positioned to be the king's agents in carrying out these tribute trading missions and assist in the political relations with the Chinese state. A century later, when Afonso de Albuquerque showed up in that part of the world, well, he depended on local Chinese who carried messages to the king in Ayutthaya. At this time in history, the Portuguese were on a roll and eager to establish trading relations with this kingdom. By the 1600s, there was already a well-established Chinatown in Ayutthaya. Chinese men came, always men, and because of the dearth of Chinese women to marry in Siam, well, they did what came natural and took local wives and the famous assimilation stories that Thailand became so famous for well, began to pick up steam. Back then, a child born of an ethnic Chinese father and a local Thai mother was called a Lok Chin, as opposed to a Lok Krung, for anyone else of mixed Thai parentage. Sorry about that pronunciation. And all throughout the 1600s and into the 1700s, more Chinese made their way to Thailand, and communities began to mature throughout Ayutthaya, all along the Chao Phraya River. And besides Ayutthaya, a sizable Chinese community had sprung up in Ligor, in the south of Thailand, east coast, Malay Peninsula. This former kingdom today is located in the city of Nakhon Si Tamarat. The Europeans called this land the Kingdom of Ligor. To the south of Nakhon Si Tamarat, there was another rather important city in the history of the Thai Chinese called Patani. Among this city's claims to fame was that it was the later home of one of the most notorious Chinese pirates during the most notorious periods of piracy in the South Seas. And though this person's life is made up of a number of legends that no one could prove or disprove, stories of his feats and adventures were faithfully passed down generation to generation. And one of these stories purports that it was this famous 16th century pirate, Lin Dao Qian, after a long and violent life raiding, plundering, and murdering people in cold blood. Well, he settled down in Patani, and after being made persona non grata at every other port of call in Asia, he turned that place into a dangerous pirate lair in no time at all. And Lin Dao Qian or Lim To Kiam, as he was known in his native Chaozhou. Sorry about that pronunciation again. This is where he settled down when he hung up his pirate sword. And this pirate from Jieyang, or Shantou, no one's really certain, it was said that it was this man, 
Lin Daoqian, who sent out the call to his hometown, and from this time began the massive wave of Diochu migration to Thailand. Today, of the maybe, I don't know, 15 million or so ethnic Chinese in Thailand, more than half, almost 60%, trace their ancestry back to the surrounding villages or cities of Jieyang, Chaozhou, and Shanto. And just over the border, in this easternmost tip of Guangdong province, was Fujian. And these Hokkien of Zhangzhou and Xiamen, they too followed in the footsteps of the Diochus, and today in Thailand, numbers-wise, are ranked, well, a very distant fourth, tied with the Cantonese. As far as today's population of ethnic Thai Chinese, after the Diochus, second place would be the Hakkas, followed by the Hainanese. And if you gave a 23andMe ancestry test to the entire Thai population, well... There's strands of Chinese DNA far beyond the numbers who identify as ethnic Chinese Thai. 1567, the Ayutthaya kingdom fell. Don't worry, it'll rise again. But when Ayutthaya fell, piracy again blossomed with no central authority to push back against their activities. The Ming emperor, Long Qing, had repealed the hygiene. And once this happened, trade took off like gangbusters, along with, you know, the increased piracy and more Chinese emigration to Thailand, among other destinations. The nemesis of the Ayutthaya kingdom were the Burmese to the west. They were most persistent in their attempts to destroy Ayutthaya. They had defeated them in 1567 in what was already the fourth Burmese-Siamese war since 1547. It had a mentionable bit of excitement concerning the time when Ayutthaya rose up and rebelled against their Burmese overlords. Just when the formidable 16th century Burmese army went in for the kill, a miracle happened. A great Burmese warrior crown prince was, well, if you believe the legend, killed in a duel to the death, riding atop elephants, no less. And in the aftermath of this fight, the Siamese king in 1592 emerged victorious, killing this Burmese crown prince. Other versions of the crown prince's death claim other explanations of his death. So following this incident, the Burmese army quit the Siamese campaign and went home, but they'd be back with a vengeance later. For now, the Ayutthaya kingdom caught a breather and tried to pick themselves up off the ground and get back in the game. One thing was for sure, as the 17th century dawned, Southeast Asian trade was becoming more and more crowded and developed, and there were huge demands for all the exotica and woods that these Nanyang kingdoms had to offer. And the Siamese demand for Chinese goods was as great as it was with the Europeans. By the time the Westerners traveled to Ayutthaya to explore trade opportunities... They found it completely locked up and controlled by the Chinese, who in all fairness had, you know, a hell of a head start. If the foreign traders wanted to do business in Ayutthaya, they had to deal with Chinese middlemen, and they didn't like that. But with so much at stake, the Europeans, as well as the Japanese, fought a very aggressive, protracted battle with the Chinese to muscle in on some of the action. During the 1600s, the Dutch and the Japanese were the leaders of the pack of foreign trading nations plying those seas. Japan, in particular, was playing for keeps in Siam and set up trade centers up and down the peninsula. By 1620, Japan had become the largest and most important trading partner for Siam. You see, by this time, the Ming Dynasty was almost but not quite on its last legs and only had a couple dozen years of life left in them. And as it happens, going back to the death of Qin Shi Huang in 210 BCE, there's always a period of instability in between the newly fallen and newly established dynasties. And with China in chaos, it put a crimp on trading operations, and this was where Japan was able to step up and fill the holes in the China goods supply chain. If Chinese porcelain was too difficult to obtain... Well, Japan also made excellent porcelain and silk products, too. 
So in these decades of the early to mid-17th century, leading up to the dawn of the Manchu Qing dynasty, Japan became the Siamese king's favorite and most lucrative trading partner. And in what will become a rather familiar tradition across Southeast Asia during this late Ming Dynasty period, ending in 1644, the Ayutthaya Chinese will come to dominate trade, shipping, and manufacturing. And they had successfully insinuated themselves into the good graces of the royal family to the extent that they enjoyed all kinds of preferential treatment that was not offered to the Europeans, the ethnic Thai, Lao, Mon, Khmer, and Vietnamese. They paid taxes and fees that well, the Chinese were given a pass on. But you know how it goes. A crisis of succession, a political upheaval, and sometimes it's not a case of meet the new boss same as the old boss. When King Prasat Thong ascended the throne in Ayutthaya, he enacted a royal trade monopoly. This was in 1629. Well, that put a damper on the extremely cozy and profitable arrangement that the Ayutthaya Chinese had enjoyed for all these years. All the key commodities had to go through the king, and he granted licenses to those who would be allowed to carry out trade in the king's name. No more trading on your own account, which was way more profitable. It was goodbye special privileges, like China, 1949. Not the end of the world. Time and again, over and over, stuff happens. The overseas Chinese community adapted. You couldn't fight the king. This was the way it was, and if what was previously unregulated now became regulated, what else could one do except go along with the royal monopoly? King Prasatong figured out right fast this whole trade thing was slightly more complicated than it looked. No problem, thought the king. I'll just go subcontract all the supply chain logistics and negotiations to the Chinese. And it didn't stop there. Many of these Ayutthaya Chinese, in addition to being invited in to assist the Siam royal monopoly, well, many were also welcomed into the civil bureaucracy to help manage the economy. So these Ayutthaya Chinese, eh, they made out okay. And they caught another nice break in 1632 when King Prasatong kicked all the Japanese traders out of his kingdom. They had not supported him in his power struggle, so the entire Japanese colony of Ayutthaya faced a king bent on retribution. And this act put Siam-Japan relations on indefinite hold for a long time. If either country had commodities that the other desired, trade only went through middlemen from now on. And the Ayutthaya Chinese traders were more than happy to step in and be those middlemen. Japan and Siam, no direct trade for the foreseeable future. Like the U.S. and China, 1950s and 60s. King Prasatong only tolerated the Chinese. Same with the Dutch. They still remained in the game, and though the royal trade monopoly remained in force, little by little, private traders started testing the waters and getting back in the game. And then finally, 1640s. China is in one of its periods of great chaos as one dynasty sinks below the waves and a new one rises. And with no government around to police the seas, piracy made another huge comeback, and no place was safe from all the horrors that pirates famously inflicted on full cities, towns, and on individuals. These are the times of such legends as Li Dan, Zheng Zhilong, and the Shi Bajir, as well as Zheng Zhilong's famous son, Zheng Changgong, better known in the West as Kaxinga. On October 22, 1633, Zheng Zhilong's fleet had handed the Dutch East India Company a terrible defeat, the siege of modern-day Tainan on the island of Taiwan. This defeat knocked them out of the competition for trade between China and Japan. But soon afterwards, the Kangxi Emperor will step into this sorry state of affairs and institute his horribly draconian Haijin, or sea ban of 1662 to 1681, and push back just enough to bring piracy back under control. This sea ban called for everyone to burn their boats and move inland 11 to 18 miles, creating this no-man's land where nothing could exist 
and there was nothing convenient along the coast anymore for pirates to plunder. And one more thing. After the Ming Dynasty fell and the Manchus took over as masters of China, well, part of China, it would take time to control everything. But in the ensuing chaos of the Manchu takeover, a lot of Chinese in Fujian and Guangdong and other places as well. Well, they got the feeling that the good times were over, and once again there was another wave of emigration to Nanyang. Time and again, there was nothing like a social upheaval to give people the idea to look for greener pastures elsewhere. The Hokkien tended to migrate to the south of Siam, in Ligor, or Nakonsi Tamaret. And the ever-growing population of Diochus, they clustered in Trat and Chantaburi, places that today are about a three-and-a-half-hour car ride from Bangkok, driving southeast. So between the Haijin Sea Ban and the social unrest at the change of the dynasty in China... A lot of people in Fujian and Guangdong jumped ship. And to commercial port cities of Nanyang, most went. And though Zheng Zhilong later went from pirate to Qing loyal bureaucrat, his son, Kaxinga, kept on fighting till the very end. And as we all recall from past CHP episodes, although the Qing dynasty officially took over in 1644, it took them decades to tamp down the last of Ming loyalist opposition. It was the same for the Mongols back in the 13th century with southern Song loyalists. I mentioned these Song royals and loyalists fled from Mongol troops, and they went first to Champa in southern Vietnam and later on to the Siam capital at Ayutthaya. Everyone had to take sides in this new situation. You were either with the Manchu Qing government, now in control of most of China, or you were with the Ming loyalists. In 1665, Zheng Jing came to Ayutthaya to pay a formal visit. He was Kaxinga's son, the next generation. And the king of Siam at this time, ruler of the Ayutthaya kingdom, this was the very long-reigning and historic King Narai, Narai the Great, the son of King Prasatong. He ruled from 1656 to 1688, concurrent with Kangxi, though not as long-lasting. King Narai kept a royal foot in two boats, maintaining relations with the Ming loyalists as well as with the Qing court. His priority was to grow trade, and grow it he did. This period under King Narai saw the Ayutthaya kingdom at its most prosperous. Kaxinga had kept the sea lanes open and safe for Siam-China tribute trade, but at a price, of course, and this was to his insistence to maintain a presence in Ayutthaya and the freedom to carry out trade and commerce there. The king of Siam was able to continue using the fig leaf of tribute trade in order to get around all the restrictions that all other foreign nations had to put up with when trying to carry out China trade. I mentioned how the Dutch traders in 1604 had muscled their way into Ayutthaya and competed head-to-head with the local Thai Chinese for the lucrative Japan trade. Well, after King Prasatong ejected the Japanese from the kingdom in 1632, the Chinese, of course, were kind of wishing to have all of that business to themselves. And as the Dutch will find out time and again, these Ayutthaya Chinese will get in between the Dutch and their mission objective to dominate trade between Siam and Japan. And after the Dutch were kicked out of their Taiwan stronghold and afterwards began getting harassed and defeated on the high seas by Zheng Zhilong's pirate fleet, now the Dutch East Indies Company, the VOC, they were really feeling the squeeze. They fought back hard and refused to be pushed around by the local Chinese who were in cahoots with the Ayutthaya court. In response to the pressure, the Dutch fleet blockaded the Chao Praia for five months until this Mini trade war was resolved in the first Dutch Siamese Treaty of 1664. Well, King Nerai, eh, he had to throw a few Chinese under the tuk tuk, so to speak, in order to appease the Dutch, but the monarchy made out okay, and that's what mattered most. And the Chinese business community had to roll with the punches, and though profits might have taken a hit, they weren't complaining. So in the 1660s, the Dutch were back in the driver's seat again with respect to Japan trade from Ayutthaya. The Dutch knew they had the upper hand for now, but their Chinese nemeses had them outgunned with a 
home field advantage, and an unparalleled network of relationships in every port, city, and town between Siam and southern Fujian province. And no sooner did King Nerai get cozy with the Dutch with his dreams of growing trade, he began to have a bad case of buyer's remorse and started sending out feelers to the British and French. To counter Dutch growing influence, King Narai had invited French Catholic missionaries into the kingdom and allowed them to you know, tend their flock there and, of course, you know, drum up any new business they can get. The English, they had other pressing engagements fighting the Dutch and weren't so responsive to the king. The Ayutthaya Chinese, they continued to do well, but had to take a back seat and allow the French to enjoy their brief love affair with Siam. Yeah, the French, they, for a while, became the darlings of the Siam court and would enjoy all this preferential treatment until the Francophile King Nerai passed in 1688. But prior to that, in 1683, the Jung pirate family enterprise that had controlled the China seas for so long was finally defeated, and Taiwan was united with Qing Dynasty China. The next year, Kangxi, with the Jungs out of the way at last, felt secure enough to rescind the Haijin Sea Ban. And with everyone once again allowed to populate the coastal areas, well, this understandably had a huge impact on the proliferation of trade between China and Siam, allowing the Ayutian Chinese to enjoy another in a series of golden ages, being perfectly placed throughout Southeast Asia to provide the engine power to restore China trade after a 28-year ban. And as I said, when King Nerai met his tragic end following the Siamese Revolution of 1688 and the Siege of Bangkok, one of his advisors usurped the throne and declared himself King Petracha. One of the first things he did was to show the French the proverbial door. They were expelled, and quite brutally too, if I may add. And with the Dutch and Portuguese already in retreat, that meant once again the Ayutthaya Chinese had Siamese trade all to themselves. And I think we'll pick up with King Petracha next time in part two, and we'll finish up the events that happened under the Ayutthaya Kingdom. We'll look at the first Thai king, who was part ethnic Chinese, with roots stretching all the way to Chaozhou, Taksin the Great. And we'll keep on going until someone cries out enough of this already. Qing Dynasty from here on out, so we know Nanyang, Southeast Asia, is going to be one of the main centers of attention as we get closer and closer to the 19th century. We'll focus on the Thailand aspect of that and the role of the Thai Chinese. Okay, that's it. Time to close down for the day. This is Laszlo Montgomery signing off from Los Angeles, California, home of the NBA 2020 world champion, Los Angeles Lakers. LeBron, AD, and company. Gong Shi Niemann is all I can say. Sorry about those nuggets, uh, Matt Sheehan. Shouldn't you be a Warriors fan? All right, me little beauties. Don't you think about coming back in two weeks' time? Same bat time, same bat channel for another exciting episode of the China History Podcast.